how healthy is your liver and how mindful are you of the things you put into it? The answers to those couple of questions will go a long way into determining how long you get to participate in this tap dance we call life. Well, in America today, more than 100 million people have some form of liver disease. Four and a half million, or 1.8% of U.S. adults have been diagnosed with liver disease. And finally, it's estimated that between 80 and 100 million people of adult age have fatty liver disease in America, and many don't realize that they have it. This, according to my friends at the American Liver Foundation. For my friend Dr. Garrett Smith, he's a leading expert on vitamin A toxicity and detoxification. He's more commonly known as the nutrition detective. He's a licensed naturopathic medical doctor in Arizona. He's also a top voice surrounding the topic of toxic bile theory. Dr. Smith specializes in applying science and logic, along with practical approaches to topics such as detoxification and nutrition, while also making challenging concepts understandable for a layperson. He hosts a weekly live stream on YouTube entitled Love Your Liver. He's also the creator of the do-it-yourself health recovery love your liver program he joined me this week to tell me more about his work and why we should all care about our liver and overall health i'm kevin mcshan let's have this conversation I'll take a few uh, seconds to welcome you to the program, and I'm super excited to learn about your uh, journey in health and fitness and medicine, my friend. Happy Friday, and it's great to see you this afternoon. Yes, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Now, uh, Dr. Smith, I know that your uh, journey with nutrition and health and fitness started when you were 11, when you started lifting weights at home, my friend. So tell me about your journey and your passion for the work that you do and what makes you so fabulous, my friend. Well, yeah, I, I did. I kind of got started at home, like I said, with dumb, dumbbells in my in my house. And that led to, I became a personal trainer. Personal training and fitness kind of led to nutrition. As I got interested in nutrition, that kind of my dad was a dentist. I always wanted to be in medicine, so that ended up leading to um, naturopathic medical school. And then I did that, and then I got out and started doing my own thing. I had a I had a brick and mortar practice in Tucson for oh gosh, until what right before COVID, so like 2006 to 2020, and then I, I decided to go all virtual because all my most of my people were not in Tucson, and. Uh, so now I'm now I'm doing my thing on the internet and doing virtual medicine and teleconsults and all that stuff and helping people all over the world. I think we've had clients in 28 countries so far. So it's it's pretty exciting. Well, there's nothing like a global reach, right? Right, right. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Smith, before we dive into your work in health and fitness and nutrition, I'm Curious to get your thoughts on the importance of men's mental health, my friend, because June is National Men's Mental Health Month, my friend. So why do you think it's important for men to be 
in touch with their mental health. Why do you think that's important? Well, well, mental health is is at the top of all of it, right? Because if if somebody wants to get better from something, what what I've seen is a lot of times, let's say you have somebody who, as soon as they introduce themselves, they're telling you about their health condition in like the first minute or two. It's almost like their identity is wrapped up in their health condition. They have to tell everybody about it, and those people are going to have a very very difficult time getting out of or fixing their issue because it's kind of become part of them with, with mental health. One of the big things I do, I, I definitely tell people I am not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I don't, I don't do that. However, being that our brains are chemi- biochemical oriented, right? They're, they're electrical, they're chemical. If, if the things that make up your brain and how your brain is working, the fluids and the chemicals and all that stuff is not right to begin with then a lot of times you can do lots of mental health work and it doesn't really stick. Uh, one of the easiest examples I give of how, how um, vulnerable your mental state is to your chemistry is simply how people's behavior changes when they haven't eaten in a while, right? And their blood sugar gets low and they start getting irritable and angry and even sometimes violent um, just because they need to eat. So that's that. it's very... One of the things I like to th- help people with is by by fixing their chemistry all of a sudden their brain works better and then they don't have to struggle so hard like like a lot of us have known we've done mental health work and whatever and it and as soon as we stop thinking about it it's a lot like posture work people work on their posture and they try to stand straight but then as soon as they stop thinking about it they go right back to the way they were because they haven't fixed the musculature that holds them in place same thing with chemistry. If you don't fix the chemistry of the brain, if your mental health problems are coming back because of chemistry, then that's just going to keep coming back and you can, you can keep trying to get to think differently about it. But if it's just the chemistry, then that helps. So that's, that's the part that I help with a lot. And yeah, we help a lot with depression and anxiety and insomnia, which obviously makes mental health very difficult when you don't sleep. Um, but yeah, we do. It, it's a very important thing for men and women doing self-improvement work is huge and also getting the chemistry right because we are just kind of like biochemical electrical sacks of meat and so we want those parts in us to be working right so yeah yeah absolutely and you know uh dr smith i know that you bring uh, a logic to science to help people with practical approaches to help explain uh complex topics like uh, detoxification and nutrition, my friend. So, uh, tell uh, tell me about your work specifically in those areas and the advancements you've made, my my friend. Why is this work important to you? Okay, so yeah, so the the biggest things I concentrate on in my work is correcting toxicities and correcting specific nutrient deficiencies. Like that's that's key to health. If we it'd be like if you wanted to make a car work right, you know, fix a car, you want to make sure that it has the right fluids in it, the right amount, they're clean, the car has all the parts it needs, and everything is, you know, working the way it should. So if we have a clean engine that has all the right parts, then things should work properly. That's what we're doing with the human body. So I, as I as I came up in naturopathic medicine, as I was learning, you know, from what I learned in fitness, from what I'd learned in nutrition, from what I'd learned in naturopathic medicine, I started to realize that I, well, I always believed that there was one thread, one root thread that held together all the chronic disease of today. I was like, it's not one cause of everything, but there's the same thread that runs through it. And that's where we get into toxic bile theory. I don't know that we have enough time to go over that today, but, but the way we fix things in toxic bile theory is we address the toxicities and we address the deficiencies. And the biggest thing that we do with people is get them to put in less toxins. That is the most important thing. Um, it, if somebody said, which is more important to fix the nutrients or to fix the toxicity coming in, it's always the toxicity coming in because less toxins comes coming in means you're less toxic. Your body can catch up on cleaning up the toxins that are already in it. And you don't need as many nutrients because... You're, why do we need nutrients to protect us against the toxins and to help us detox? So if you don't put them in, you don't need as many versus 
you know, what a lot of people do where they just try to shove in more and more nutrients. And the problem today is that a lot of people with a lot of the things they think are nutrients, they're actually toxic. So they're kind of doing themselves double wrong because they're putting in a toxin and then they're, they're depleting their nutrients further with the toxin and it's just not helping them in any way. So, so yeah, so that's where we kind of do things different and all those things feed into what's called toxic bile theory, which is basically the idea of chronic disease being caused by your liver makes bile, your liver stores toxins, your liver makes bile out of those toxins. And if those toxins leak into your bloodstream, that is the root of your chronic disease. And wh what we've seen is as we fix this, as we make the bile less toxic and we leak less, excuse me, as we leak less, people's health problems go away. So, so the theory seems to be proving true and helping people get better. So that's, that's the basis of my work. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dr. Smith, I know that you have placed an emphasis, emphasis on nutrition specifically. And one of the reasons, my friend, I was excited to talk to you was, uh, Dr. Smith, I was born with uh, cerebral palsy. So I uh, take fitness and nutrition very uh, seriously because if I don't exercise, exercise and watch what I put in my body. Uh, my muscles contract uh, faster than most people because of the cerebral palsy I was born with. So how important do you think it is for people to really uh, take note of what they're putting in their bodies because it makes a difference in their overall health, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, one of the things that I, that I work on a lot with people with um, the things I do where, where we work on vitamin A toxicity and, and we don't have people take vitamin D supplements and we don't generally ever supplement calcium. Well, like when you're talking about muscles contracting, one of the biggest things that causes muscles to contract and stiffen and joints to calcify is, is an excess amount of calcium in the blood. When you have too much calcium in the blood, your body will desperately put it into places, your joints, your, your brain, your heart, your muscles, and it, it, they're calcifying and also muscles contract with calcium. So one of the biggest things we do is we don't put those things in. And then we do make sure that people get plenty of magnesium because you need magnesium to relax muscles. You also need potassium too, but, but magnesium is the biggest one that helps relax in it. It also helps magnesium helps to decalcify. So we like to use a lot of topical magnesium or transdermal magnesium approaches where you absorb the magnesium through your skin. It does hit the areas you put it on first, right? That's how it's going in. So if you have certain areas that are tight or tense or stiff or painful, we tend to put the topical magnesium on those areas first. And then people often get a lot of relief just from that. So, so that's like one approach, kind of a systemic, you know, systematic approach to relaxing muscle, excess muscle tension that we do a lot. Um, magnesium from food, like, you can look up magnesium in foods, and th the sad thing is today, people just aren't generally going to be getting enough from foods. It's unless they very specifically eat only certain foods every day, day in, day out, they're just not going to make it. And then with what, what I do with the hair testing and the blood testing, we can see these deficiencies, we can address them, we can have people tell us how they're feeling, we can see how their tests respond, and then we can give them what they need, we can adjust up or down, or some, sometimes people get lucky. They don't need it at all. Sometimes people need more than others. So we can kind of customize it to people. And then people could try to do it through food. They can always try to do it through food. If it works, that's, that's the best. If it doesn't, then we know it's not working and then we can take action to, to fix it. So, yeah, so we fixing it through nutrition is, is what we do the, both the toxicities and the deficiencies. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dr. Smith, they tell me that you, you've earned the nickname of, of the nutrition detective, my friend. And I'm wondering how you got that nickname. And if you can explain to me in greater detail about vitamin A uh, toxicity, my friend. And what does that really mean in the layman's terms, my friend? Okay, okay. So the nutrition detective, you know, name or nickname or brand kind of came about me and 
some other gentlemen who were in the who were in my group were talking about it and we wanted to make it something bigger than just than just me good old Garrett Smith here and so I I was kind of, I think I think I may have suggested it I think I may have come up with the idea um but it was just I kind of do like when people watch my live streams and we have these we have these you know suspects these diseases and we can go through the research and find we find the same culprits all the time like the same toxins the same nutrient deficiencies and it's kind of it was kind of like there's there's a problem in people's health today like it's things are not working for people in general and figuring out what is going on is is like what i do so i just i i'm very good i'm blessed with being very good at going through the research i'm blessed with being able to figure out what research is useful and what is not and then we put it together into you know a theory and then we apply it and then if we see people getting better then we know that we are on the right track so so yeah one of the one of the culprits one of the major suspects that i work on is vitamin a toxicity so real quick what we call vitamin a is 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 groups of whenever you see groups of things that are in a in a vitamin um, like multiple things that are part of the the family. So like there's carotenoids, which are the plant forms of vitamin A, and then animals convert those into retinoids, which is the animal forms of vitamin A. So there's there's this huge group of compounds that people will say, well, you need vitamin A. And then you go, well, which one? And they go, well, you need retinol. And I go, but the body doesn't use retinol. The body theoretically might only use what's called retinoic acid, it just becomes a big thing, but vitamin A is an alcohol. It is, it is in this vitamin A goes through the exact same detox pathway as alcohol does ethanol, the stuff that, you know, people drink to get drunk. So vitamin A, supposedly a vitamin is going through the exact same detox pathway as alcohol, a known toxin, which start you meet you, people should immediately go, well, wait, wait, we have to detox a vitamin. So then you can store vitamin A in your fat tissues, in the liver and in the body fat. So if you, the, the simple logic of it is if you take in more vitamin A in a day, then you are able to get rid of, you are accumulating it. You are storing it. And vitamin A toxicity is all over the literature when, when you start looking for it and it, it, so it accumulates and then it causes problems as it accumulates. You could accumulate it all at once with like huge doses of supplements or, or, um, polar bear liver or fish, you know, certain fish livers. I've got, I've got a whole Twitter thread on how people have poisoned themselves with liver, including one meal of fish liver. So it's, it's real. It's, it's out there. It's happening. People will try to say that it doesn't happen from food and it only happens from supplements. And I then post lots of research showing that they are quite wrong and that it happens from all of it. And it all adds together because it's all the same chemical compounds. So what we do to fix this problem is we basically try to get people taking in less vitamin A in a day than they are able to excrete. Now we can't ever know these numbers. Nobody gets to know these numbers. How much is, you know, how much is leaving in a person daily. So we tend to err on the side of uh, less vitamin A coming in rather than more. And then we do things to, we reduce the vitamin A coming in. We facilitate the removal of vitamin A via the bile um, by eating things like soluble fiber, whether that's foods or some people do supplements. We use things like charcoal, which binds to bile and those things hold on to it so that then people will poop out their toxic bile instead of reabsorbing it through their guts and what's called the enterohepatic circulation. So yeah. And then, then we, then we make sure people get the right nutrients, which is only a couple of minerals, you know, we look at, we especially focus on potassium, magnesium, zinc, selenium, molybdenum, and we make sure that the body's getting enough of those. And then we see things start to get better over time. As long as people are listening to their body's feedback, because sometimes people try some of these things and they don't feel good on them. And we either have them do less or stop doing them. So yeah, so it's just, it's all kind of this combination approach to, to fixing these things and and yeah vitamin a toxicity is a, is kind of my thing but we work on all sorts of things like i don't have people eat fish or shellfish either because 
they are full of mercury. Fish and shellfish contain mercury that I can see on a hair test. If people are eating them in the last six months, I can tell on a hair test. So there's enough mercury that you can always tell. So things like that, that's not vitamin A, but it's another known toxin. And then fish can, fish and shellfish contain all the other toxins that are in the ocean because they're breathing and marinating in the water all day long. So it's just, we make certain choices today that sadly we have to, because that's the environment today. That's the context. People didn't used to have to do these things, but the way the world is today, we have to make certain choices based on where we are. So that's, that's that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Dr. Smith, you brought up, uh, toxic bio theory earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder, well, what thing if we can have a, a deeper uh, conversation about it? And uh, I'm fascinated to know about the live stream you host as well. So you can take, any of those two questions in any direction you would like, my friends. Okay. Well, for, for people who are here, and if you want to get the full explanation of toxic bile theory, um, on my YouTube channel, which is just the Nutrition Detective, you know, YouTube channel, uh, live streams 71 and 53 are the ones where I go specifically. It's kind of like the basics, the foundations of toxic bile theory. So that's where if you want to, I'll give you a, a short version here, but if you want to get the full full version that's going to be there. I mean, that, cause that's probably an hour, hour and a half of talking about it here. The simple thing is, okay. The liver stores or, or in the research, it will say accumulates toxins. The liver accumulates toxic metals. It accumulates fat soluble toxins. It accumulates vitamin A. It accumulates copper. It accumulates manganese. It accumulates all these toxic things that are not necessary for us to live. It does this in an effort to protect us because it can't get rid of them fast enough. It, it, it can't get rid of them fast enough, but it needs them out of the blood because if they get too high in the blood and they affect your brain, they affect your heart, it could, you could die. So your body will pull them out of the blood. How does your liver get rid of these toxins? Well, people mistakenly talk about detox with the liver. They think that the liver detoxes things. No, the liver, the liver processes things and stores things. The liver puts the toxins into the bile. The bile, therefore, the way I have people look at it is the bile is the liver's poop. So the liver poops and then you poop, the liver's poop out. That's, that's how this works. Things are not detoxed by the liver. Things are not truly, in my opinion, detoxed until they have left your body, whether that's through the poop or the pee or the sweat or some other way. So the, if they're still in your body, they're not detoxed because they're still there doing damage. So your liver makes the bile. The bile is supposed to go into your intestines and then you poop out some portion of it each day. Normally on a normal standard American diet, we only poop out about 5% of the bile we make a day. The other 95% of it, this is the big, this is the problem. 95% of that bile is a, reabsorbed by your intestines. It's called the entero, which means gut, hepatic liver. So enterohepatic circulation, it's absorbed by your intestines. It goes right back to your liver and then your liver has to deal with it again. So it's like this loop that we want to escape. We want that toxic bile to not go back up to your liver. So your liver has to deal with it again. So what we do is we try to, we, we try to put less toxins in. So eventually the bile becomes less toxic because there's less toxins around. And we want to do things that what are, it's called adsorbing or soaking up the bile like soluble fiber and like charcoal so that we can grab onto the bile. It can hold it. And then we poop out more than we would normally. So toxic bile theory, the big part of it is so toxic bile is so damaging, so irritating. So, so like it's think of it as like an acid that eats through things. It will eat holes in the liver cells that make it. It can eat holes in the tiny bile ducts in the liver. It can eat holes in the big bile ducts. It eats holes in your intestines. That is leaky gut. If you've ever talked to anybody about leaky gut, they never seem to have a reason that causes it, but bile will eat holes in the liver. Bile, if it goes back up into your stomach, will cause acid reflux and ulcers. It will eat holes in your stomach or even your esophagus. So bile is really, really toxic. 
and we want to get rid of it. But if it goes, to, so your liver will dump bile. One of the most common ways people understand it is every time you eat, you will dump bile into the intestines. That's the trigger. That's one of the big triggers. Okay. So if you have leaks every time you dump, sorry, I forgot to add one more thing. By definition, so your liver stores toxins, your liver makes bile. Therefore, and the, the bile is how your liver gets rid of toxins. Therefore, bile is the most toxic fluid in your body. Then if it leaks into your bloodstream, you have now put the most toxic fluid in your entire body into your bloodstream, and it's now going to go everywhere in the body that the blood goes until the liver can filter it out again. So if you so you got the liver, you know, you got the enterohepatic circulation pulling bile back up to the liver, so the liver has to deal with it again. But if it also goes into the bloodstream, that's not leaving. Well, some of it leaves via the kidneys, hurts the kidneys on the way by too. Some of it's coming out through your skin. Your skin issues are toxic bile coming out through your skin. But it goes everywhere. It goes to your brain. It goes to your heart. It goes to your muscles. It goes to your organs until the liver can then filter it out of the blood again. But we are eating multiple times a day where, you know, when, when we learn that things like stress and exercise and sweating and heat and other things also cause you to dump bile. This is why oftentimes people feel bad after they get stressed, they dumped bile into their system. It leaked in and now they're feeling the effects. So what we are trying to do and, and how we are fixing chronic diseases is we make the bile less toxic. We help fix the leaks. And then as, as the bile is less toxic and people leak less, they see they have less bile going into their blood and they see their diseases decrease and get better. That's that's toxic bile theory in a nutshell. And that's that's the and the live streams, like I say, I do the live streams every week. Um have different topics. Like the the bile theory, toxic bile theory ones, 53 and 71. And other than that, we just I just kind of pick a topic each week. Some weeks are just subscriber Q and A's. Some I have a big topic to go over, and then we do subscriber Q and A after that. They these are these are not short live streams. It can be two hours to four hours because I cover a lot of lot of research in there. But yeah, that's that's those two things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Doctor uh, Smith, I'm curious to get your general opinion on what do you think people in America value their health and make it a top priority and. What do we have to do to convince people to make their health a top priority in your opinion? Ooh, what are we going to do? The, 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 it, that's a very difficult thing to do because most people, you know, they're, they're busy with their lives. They're busy with their families. They're busy with work. And they, they just want something. If they feel bad, they just want something to make themselves feel better. And short term, that's what pharmaceuticals do for some people. I mean, they, they work a, a bit, but oftentimes people, you know, there's all this giant list of side effects and all this thing, but they, most people don't want to take responsibility for their health. And what we talk about in the program is, I mean, we've had, we have people, when we're talking about liver problems, people who were born jaundiced, which is something like 60 to 80% of babies today are born jaundiced. That means they are being born with a liver problem already. So they are starting their lives with a liver problem. Jaundice is defined. It's basically, a you know, you're leaking bile in your bloodstream. Jaundice is bile in your bloodstream. It's bile, bilirubin, bile erubin in your blood, and it's showing up. It's accumulating in your skin. So the very first thing, toxic bile theory is shown in jaundiced kids when they're born. Um. So if somebody was born with this, let's say, or somebody was given, you know, against their, against their best interests, they were given lots of medications or lots of shots as a child, or, or they were exposed to toxins, whether it's in their food or water or whatever, however, they got sick, whatever made them sick. The key thing for people who want to get better is not to just throw blame at all the people and all the reasons they were sick. Sure. That may be the thing you can do with that knowledge is if you know why you got sick is you can then avoid that stuff and, and you can do better after that. But the thing that people have to do is just take responsibility for where they are at. Th they are the only person who can change their health state. 
they have to say, okay, so if I know what to eat now, I have to choose to eat that. If I know what to avoid now, I have to choose to avoid it. And they have to take responsibility. And then once they know the proper things to do, they have to start doing it. Many, many people don't want to take responsibility for their health. And so they don't. And so they are left with, you know, um, choosing pharmaceuticals basically, or not doing anything. Both of those don't tend to lead to good outcomes in my opinion. So we are the very first thing we are doing is like people, if, if they say, they come into my program and they say, this is too much stuff. I don't have time to read this. I don't have time to watch the videos. Well, one of the sayings I have is if you use all your, all your time to make money, or if you, I'm sorry, if you spend all your health to make money, you're probably going to end up spending all your money to get back your health. So we can kind of make choices along the way to, you know, do things that are good for us or to kind of avoid or deny them. And then things get worse. And then we wonder why we're sick. Well, there's, there's always reasons why people are sick. There's always reasons. And we're here to teach people what those are. Here's how you can avoid them. Here's the things you can do. Here's the things you can't do. I tell people, I don't care what you eat. I don't care what pills you take. I don't, I, I, I care about people and I'm here to help people, but I cannot stress over what people do and don't do because I have no, I, I can't take responsibility for other people. People have to take responsibility for themselves. So yeah, that's uh, in, until people decide to take responsibility for their health. And some, many, many do. We have many, many people in, in the program who are, you know, they would be called health nuts. And, and I, I am one. I was one. I still am one, basically. The problem is, is when health nuts, when they're very, they're very determined and they're very disciplined and they're going to do what they think is best, but they're given bad information. And then they're hurting themselves with best, their best interests, they're trying to do good for themselves, but they're hurting themselves with, with bad information, like trying to eat lots of vitamin A for health. And then they find that their health is getting worse and worse and worse. And they don't know what's, what's going on. All they know is that whatever I'm doing isn't working. And so then hopefully they find me and then we, we take them out of that. So that's what I got. Yeah. And doctors with, I wonder what your thoughts on the correlation between science-based uh, nutrition and alternative health. Do you think there's a correlation there at all, my friend? Well, alternative health is a very interesting thing because, as I joke about, like no one, no one has an no one has an herbal met herbal deficiency. No one has a deficiency in any herb. No one has a deficiency in acupuncture needles. Like no one has many of the alternative therapies are kind of like. I, I do use some homeopathy in my practice, but homeopathy is the definition of treating symptoms. They get your symptom list and they give you a remedy. And what is it actually fixing? Where we're, they're just looking at symptoms and they're giving you a remedy. I mean, if, if we wanted to talk about treating symptoms, that's what homeopathy does. So I'm this is why I'm kind of a black sheep in even the alternative world because I don't go along with a lot of the things. And I, I, I've explained how a lot of alternative therapies like coffee enemas work, they work by getting you to dump a whole bunch of bile, but nobody ever talks about that. So I, I can figure out why certain things work because of how they relate to the bile system. Um, science based science. Well, what we call is we, we have like science led or evidence led or evidence. Yeah. Evidence led nutrition or evidence based nutrition and this this is the difficult thing because science as a whole has been corrupted for a very long time by in, by big money interests they can basically scientists and researchers know that if they want to continue getting research grants or studies that they can do so they can make a living if a company comes to them saying, we, we want you to study this wink, wink. I mean, they want an outcome. They want that study to say something and they can design the study to come up with a certain result. They can, you know, tweak statistics so that they're looking at the best result they can get. Um, they could basically buy studies. I mean, there's probably plenty of places around the world, maybe China where you could hire 
researchers to find whatever you want. And there's, there's actually no one who polices researchers. So could, a, could, in theory, a researcher make up an entire study, whole cloth, like they, they never even did any of the research, and they just wrote it all down on paper and they sent it into a journal. I mean, the journal doesn't check whether they actually did the work. They just read the paper and they go, oh, this sounds good. We'll publish it. So, so research, can, it's like when they come out with research on alcohol being good for you. How much money does the alcohol industry have? They have plenty of money to pay researchers to show somehow that alcohol is good. One of the interesting things about the vitamin A research is whenever you come across a, whenever we come across a paper where the researchers found that vitamin A was bad and it did the opposite thing that they were expecting, there's always apologetics at the start of the paper saying vitamin A is good and necessary, but this study came out with bad results. And then they do the same thing at the very end. As soon as they end the paper, they're like, well, we found all this bad stuff, but vitamin A is very good and necessary and we all need it. So the apologetics means that they already had a bias. They were The scientists were upset that they found something that they weren't expecting. Like, big example, retin-A study, a big retin-A study on U.S. war veterans. They are, well, veterans at least. It was U.S. military veterans. They gave these guys retin-A, which is a form of vitamin A that is made in your body. If you eat vitamin A, you make tretinoin, retin-A, all trans-retinoic acid in your body. So if you eat vitamin A, you are making retin-A in your body. So they gave these guys retin-A cream to put on their face. The idea was they were going to prevent their face and their ears. They were going to try to prevent skin cancer by giving them retin-A to rub on their face. They had to stop the study early because too many of the veterans were dying early, the ones who got the retin-A. The crazy thing about this paper is they specifically say in the paper that they took out the guys, well, the vets, who they thought were going to die early. So they were just looking at their health already, and they said, oh, you're, you're too sick. We're going to take you out. You're too sick. We're going to take you out. So they took out all the guys they thought were going to die early, and then they still had a problem with too many guys dying early. So this is like how this is this is what they do with vitamin A. They're like, that's good for this. We're going to give it. And then they find that, I mean, three studies on beta carotene were stopped early because people were dying early or getting cancer early or whatever. It's crazy. So even in the research, they try to make it look good and it comes out as a disaster. Um, so yeah, it's it's science science. We we have to be able to look at science, the research, and and look at it and go. Somebody has to go into it with, if somebody goes into science with a totally open mind, but they take every research paper as it's true and, and the researchers did not lie and they did not make up anything and they did not fudge the t statistics. This is why everybody's so confused. It's because they take everything as valid. And that is one thing that I have learned not to do is like cell studies are not, are not human studies. So looking at cells is almost a waste of time, in my opinion. Um, but everybody loves to look at cell studies and then jump to humans, and it just doesn't work that way. Oftentimes, cell studies, the results of cell studies, what I found, are exactly the opposite in real people. So we've got people making terribly based decisions on incomplete information or even dishonest information. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do, figuring out what is useful and what is not. I mean, we have to look at the research and then we have to try it in people. If we're, if we're not sure, we got to try it out. And I do this. I, any good researcher, any good, any good practitioner who is trying something new doesn't do it on other people first. They do it on themselves because that's, if you're willing to take the risk, which I am, you, you do it on yourself first to make sure it's safe because why would you want to hurt anybody else with something that you're not sure about? So I, I look at I look at the science and the stuff we're doing as we we get we can look at the real world to get an idea of what makes sense. We can then look at the research to find what backs it up and what makes sense in the research, and then we try it out in real people again to see if everything lines up. And that's that's my approach to that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Doctor says I've got three questions left for you, and the first has to do with uh, D3 supplements, my friends, and whether you think those are 
potentially toxic. Tell me more, my friend. Well, we know that. Okay, so well, let me first say I always like to lead with this. I believe humans need sunlight or ultraviolet light to be happy and healthy. This is the important thing. We need light. That's why we don't have much hair is so we can get light to our skin. I'm the thing I'm not sure about is vitamin D science as a whole, because what is vitamin D? It's an oxidized cholesterol molecule. So you have a, you have a cholesterol molecule go up to your skin, the sun or UV light oxidizes it. And then it goes back into our system and does whatever it does. Vitamin D cholecalciferol D3 um, has been shown in, in, in the past 1940s and 50s when they were fortifying milk and other products with it. There was even vitamin D3 in beer for a while, if you can believe it, you know, like 70, 80 years ago. There was children who were dying of from the vitamin D that was put into these food products. It was blamed on a genetic problem. Well, so now we know, and then there in the since then there have been times when when milk companies have accidentally over fortified milk and killed children. There are the reality of it is is vitamin D three as cholecalciferol. So most people know about rat poison and they think of coumadin or warfarin, which is a blood thinner. That's the first line mouse and rat poison, the the baits. Well, what's the next level when the, when the Coumadin and Warfarin are not working anymore on the mice and the rats or the mice and the rats have figured out not to eat it, or they've simply become immune to it. The next level mouse and rat poison is vitamin D3 baits. They put high doses of vitamin D3 into rat baits so that they eat them and they, they basically calcify and clot and die. Well, it's also well known that dogs and cats who eat these baits will go to the vet with kidney failure and sometimes die. So we know that vitamin D is then toxic to mouse, mice and rats and dogs and cats. And then I've just told you about how it's killed humans before. When we start learning about um, how in the apartheid days in South Africa, th they studied vitamin D as a potential genocidal tool. So it is apparently effective enough at killing humans that they wanted to study it as using it to kill humans. So with all this knowledge, what we do in the program is we don't take vitamin D supplements ever. We don't use cod liver oil, which cod liver oil has vitamin A and vitamin D by mouth. So we don't, we don't use those things. Uh, I often have people who, you know, there'll probably be some people here today who watch this and they stop there. They're like, wow. I know. And so if you're taking vitamin D and you're, you're feeling really stiff, really achy, really like you're getting cramps. You're just, you're feeling old and tired and you're taking your vitamin D and you stop. And in a month you feel significantly better. You were poisoning yourself with your vitamin D supplements. Even if your blood level was low, you can still feel absolutely terrible. Um, so what do we do to quote unquote fix vitamin D problems. Well, in the literature, obviously we need sunlight or ultraviolet light. Humans are designed to get light. We need light. So I highly suggest that people, you know, either get in the sun. If people live in dark areas, you can do tanning beds. You can do spurty like tanning lamps. There are other UV tanning lamps out there or UV, UV lamps you can do. They're usually UVA and UVB. Um, UVA is better at breaking down vitamin A in the skin. So, so sunlight helps to break down toxic vitamin A in the skin. Uh, UVB helps make vitamin D more. Like I said, they're usually a mix of both. Um, so what we do is we make sure people are getting light. Um, I do not believe the people have to realize that the, the studies on tanning beds that came out where they were trying to make it look like they cause skin cancer were mainly done by sunscreen companies. Obviously, a, a conflict of interest there when L'Oreal, one of the world's greatest sunscreen makers, is saying they're funding studies to make tanning beds look bad. 
Imagine um, if people, let's say they knew about tanning beds and they didn't think they were bad and they went to go tan, you know, do, do like five minutes a week in a tanning bed. And then all of a sudden, all those dreary winter months, they were happier and they didn't need to be put on pharmaceutical meds, antidepressants, SSRIs, and all that stuff. So you start to realize it, it, it. I learned that in Alaska, the doctors know in Alaska that doing eight minutes a week of a tanning bed will keep people's vitamin D levels just fine. Just eight minutes a week of a tanning bed. So I tend to believe that the the tanning bed stuff was was kind of a propaganda. It was to help the pharmaceutical industry, and the sunscreen industry is the pharmaceutical industry. So there's that. Then what we do is we make sure people are getting. So there are papers out there. There's research out there that shows that if you if if someone was not getting enough enough protein, if they get more protein, their vitamin D levels go up. If someone was not getting enough zinc, if they get more zinc, their vitamin D levels go up. If someone was not getting enough magnesium and they get enough magnesium, their vitamin D levels go up. So what we do, and I, and do I want people to get enough protein and magnesium and zinc? Yes. So we do these things and it fixes their, fixes their, their internal vitamin D level. And then they get light. And then this problem is fixed. And I know that getting people enough protein makes them healthier. Getting enough zinc makes them healthier. Getting enough magnesium gets them healthier. And if the side effect is that their vitamin D goes up, great. At least I didn't have to have them taking rat poison. So that is how we fix these things. And that, that's personal responsibility. If somebody says, well, I don't want to go get sunlight. I don't want to go tan. I don't want to buy a tanning lamp. Then, then you, you're taking, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry makes your vitamin D pills. This is, that's who makes it. Pharma houses make vitamin D pills. They irradiate sheep's wool, lanolin from sheep's wool. That they, they irradiate it to make vitamin D supplements. And I deal with this all the time. So anyway, we don't have anybody take it. We fix vitamin D levels anyway, and nobody has to take any rat poison. So that's that's my thing on that. Well, that, that that's certainly a positive, my friend. And I'm going to end with this, my friend, because I'm interested, doctor, to ask you about how your priorities to help uh, people have shifted over the years. And when you look at your own personal and professional legacy, doctor, how do you want that to be defined? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm doing this to, I'm doing, I, I do all this work partially because I find it amazingly interesting. And I'm, I'm just, I was blessed with, you know, natural abilities to do this stuff. In terms of what I'm trying to be remembered for, in terms of I, I want to help with the toxic bile theory paradigm, I want to help shift medicine overall towards people realizing why, why certain things they do make them feel bad. And as they as they get healthier and healthier, those things stop making them feel as bad. I mean, the, the, the three prongs of my approach, one is we reduce the toxins going in. Knowing what the toxins are then is the biggest battle there. And once we have a good handle on those, then we can reduce the intake of them. We can't zero it. Like, I mean, living is killing us. Breathing oxygen is killing us slowly. We, 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 are, we are here for a short time. We can make that time here much better by taking in less poisons. Um, the second thing we do is we want to facilitate the removal of toxins from the system that's typically things that help you get rid of bile um, and help you detox better, flesh niacin, soluble fiber, activated charcoal, these things. And then we want to restore the body's nutrition. And that's like the minerals I talked about and like the flesh niacin and lactoferrin and other things that we that we do there. Making sure people get enough protein. That's a huge thing. It doesn't have to be animal protein, but it needs to be enough protein. And when people don't do animal proteins, it can be difficult to get enough protein. Um, anybody who's done a vegetarian diet, which I did in back in college, I, I, it was hard. It was hard to get enough protein. Um, so anyway, so those, that's, that, those are the big things. The toxic bile theory is just kind of my expansion on, I mean, uh, Grant Jenneru's work. He introduced me to vitamin A toxicity. Anthony Mawson introduced me to the concept of that, that turned into toxic bile theory. And then now we have a lot of other people spreading it, um, spreading the word on Twitter and other places. Somebody just sent me a, a letter from a telegram group that it was 19,000 people and somebody's pushing, you know, vitamin A toxicity and toxic bile theory there. 
So it's, it's getting, that's why I'm doing all these podcasts is I'm just trying to get the word out there. Not, not for my sake, but for humanity's sake. So we can, you know, I, I'm not totally against pharmaceuticals. They're great, especially in acute emergency type situations. That's where they are best where conventional medicine and pharmaceuticals are terrible, absolutely terrible is chronic disease. And that is my area. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to change. So I want to just completely change how, I mean, if people are sick and they don't want to do anything about it, they don't want to take any responsibility. That's fine. They can do that. But if they do decide they want to feel better, I want to give them the hows and the whys so that they can get better. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dr. Smith, follow it. Tell me if people want to get uh, connected with the good work that you uh, do or you uh, personally. What's the best way they can do that? Oh, if somebody wants to, to get more in contact with me, the best the best way is through um, nut- our nutritiondetective.com website. Um, Julie answers all the emails there as, you know, as well as she can. It's, it's a lot of contacts these days. So yeah, nutritiondetective.com is where people can find my testing and consultation packages and my other practitioners and um, the supplements that we make. There is also for people who just want to do the do-it-yourself program, which is, which is you know, super affordable. It's $99 a year and you get, you get access to the Love Your Liver program, get access to over 2,000 other members. It's a very active forum. It's basically like social media as it was supposed to be. Somebody on Twitter the other day said that the, the love your liver, um, forum was basically full of the nicest people on the internet because I do not allow trolls. I do not allow anyone who's in there who is not in line with what we do. So it stays very, it stays very copacetic and people are there just trying to help each other. So it's, it's really great, but that's, yeah, that's, that's the, um, that's where people can get my do it yourself program. The Love Your Liver program. That's members.nutritiondetective.com. And you can find that from the main website too. And then the place where I'm most active on social media is Twitter, which is my handle is NutriDetect. So N U T R I D E T E C T, because I can't spell Nutrition Detective there. But if you look on any, and then there's the YouTube channel, the Nutrition Detective YouTube channel, where I do the live streams every week. And sometimes we do special episodes um, on top of that. So yeah, those are the best places to find me. If you search for me on social media, you'll find, and you search for Nutrition Detective, you'll you'll find me. Or you search for Nutrition Detective Garrett Smith, you'll find me. That's how you can find me. Well, fabulous. Doctor, I want to wish you a good weekend, and I want to thank you for all of the good work that you've done to uh, improve liver health across America and beyond, my friend. And I want to thank you for engaging in conversation with me this afternoon. It's most appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here.